kind of teach those same concepts through YouTube and just having a platform where uh, I can take what I've learned and take things I've, I've learned throughout the, the process and, and hopefully inspire others to learn those and, and enjoy those things as well. Today, I had the pleasure of interviewing Keith Galley. Keith is a data science YouTuber who focuses on in-depth library tutorials and real-world projects. Outside of YouTube, Keith works at a conversational AI startup called Posh Technologies, where he's worked in roles ranging from NLP to project management. Keith holds his bachelor's and master's degrees in computer science from MIT. And in this interview, we talk about Keith's experience working with data science at a startup, how he got interested in making content and his own personal learning philosophy. I hope you enjoy our chat. Keith, thank you so much for coming in. You obviously have an incredible YouTube channel where you make some sweet tutorials, a few of which I have followed along, uh, but you're working in a startup doing everything from data science to project management to, uh, to who knows what. And I think that <laughs> both of those experiences will be very, very interesting to anyone who really watches my videos, both from understanding what, uh, what makes a good tutorial, how to learn most efficiently, but also to what the data science work life is like, especially at more of a startup you feeling company. Again, thank you for coming in. Thank you for having me, Ken. Uh, yeah, this is a good opportunity. I feel like I, I walk through a lot of tutorials on my channel, but I don't have the time to really sit down and and talk about everything that's going on in the day to day. So excited to have that opportunity. So, hey everyone, uh, glad to be here. Uh, as Ken mentioned, my name is Keith Galley. I make YouTube channel, uh, YouTube videos on all sorts of programming concepts, mainly focused on data science, uh, you know, comprehensive data science library tutorials on concepts like pandas, matplotlib, scikit-learn, etc., as well as um, a lot of real-world data science projects. So that's a little bit about what I do here on YouTube. But uh, in addition, as, as Ken mentioned, uh, yeah, I'm also, my full-time job is at a startup called posh.tech. And in that, you know, I was one of the very early members at, at, at this company. And as a result of that, I've wore a lot of different hats uh, over my time there. Our company builds chatbots. Um, so I've done a lot of work in the natural language processing side of things. And then as we started growing, I kind of worked in more project management, uh, kind of higher level things. And my current official title is head of customer success. So now I'm really managing a lot of our customer engagement. So all over the spectrum in that, in that realm as well. That's awesome. A little known fact about myself is for about nine months, I was a product owner for a lot of data science operations at a, a startup in Chicago. I guess it's not really a startup, but, um, they, they call themselves startup. And I'm interested to hear your perspective on the project management or project ownership side versus data science. I thought I would love it because you're doing all of quote unquote, the fun stuff. You're like explaining the models. You're, you're telling people like, Hey, we can build this. Like, let's do this. And then I realized that I quite enjoyed the technical side just a little bit more. I felt like I had more control over what I was doing. Did you feel something similar or was it, um, you know, they're kind of, uh, equitable on your end? Yeah, that's a, a good question. I would say in general, my feeling is that I, I've really enjoyed the project management aspect of things uh, because I think the one thing I love coding, I love just like being creative, like figuring out, you know, you know, you just have a blank slate and you can create all sorts of cool things. You can build all sorts of cool models. Uh, but the one thing that I really like about project management is that there's more of that people aspect. So I feel like a lot of the technical skills that I love, uh, I can continue to love them because I'm not working, uh, you know, 24 seven at my job using, you know, writing code and then, you know, following that up with writing more code as part of a, you know, a YouTube tutorial. So for me, like the project management for the, the full-time role uh, has been nice because you, you, you're working with people, you're trying to organize and think about software projects at a higher level and how you can take that and break it into small tasks. You still see a lot of code, so you still get that, you know, nitty gritty technical feel. Um, but it's, it's, I think you're balancing more things. You're not just writing code. There's a lot of other factors you have to consider. You're growing a lot of like 
I guess, interpersonal skills, uh, building relationships with team members, you know, you're learning how to have difficult conversations. So I don't think that I like, you know, data science or project management, like one over the other, but I think that I've enjoyed having a balance of the two where full-time I focus on project management and then, uh, you know, YouTube channel, as well as at the startup, I'm also writing code, but it's a little bit more balanced than just doing one or the other. I see that so much in my own life as well, actually. Right now, I have a very technical project going on at work, and the amount of technical content that I <laughs> am doing on YouTube is going through the floor. And I'm sure once that eases up and it's back to more you know, project owners of actually doing selling, and consulting services, whatever that might be, it'll hopefully go the other way and I'll start to do a lot more projects on my channel. And uh, it's funny how that works. I think, at least for me, I have this threshold where I can be coding too much and I do so much better with programming with data science when it's more on my own terms. And uh, that's, that, that can be a little bit hard to find, but um, you're, you're right. It may, maybe it is just all about balance in the, in the long run here. Yeah. Well, as a selfish comment, I'm happy that the technical content has gone down a little bit because that allowed me to be on here today. So I'm, I'm happy with that. But uh, yeah, it, it is a tough balance. And I am right there with you with, you know, I love doing data science on my own terms and just not feeling like pressed to complete a deadline, having fun with it. Uh, and it's, it's tough sometimes striking that balance when you are working, you know, in a consulting role that you're very technical, very hands-on. And then you know, trying to keep that going into your own technical projects to show on YouTube. It's just, uh, I'm right there with you. I feel that it's tough. For sure. Well, you know, we're talking <laughs> about the technical stuff. I'd love to learn about how you learn those things. You know, your kind of educational background, your, you know, if you learned it in school, if you learned it on the internet, if you even learned it on YouTube, uh, whatever that might be, that's, that's always fascinating to me. And also I'm, I'm sure to everyone watching. Yeah, so I'll uh, definitely happy. I love walking through that kind of journey. And I'll start, I'm going to start young. I'm going to start kind of, you know, day one. When I was one. two months old. <laughs> exactly. I was already doing cac. No. Um, when I was very young, one of my earliest memories is like sitting on, you know, my old PC at home playing a game called Math Blaster. You did like, Remember Math you Blaster. Shot, like, <laughs> okay, we're, we're right there. I feel like some viewers might not know it, but great game. I don't remember exactly what we were doing, but we were solving equations, like simple equations, like addition, multiplication, and like shooting asteroids at the same time. Uh, so kind of taking that, that kind of segues into just, I grew up loving math, uh, you know, in like middle school, high school, you know, I was like kind of excited to do my math homework. Not going to lie. Like I just enjoyed like that logical thinking uh, of, of solving problems. Um, so I kind of had that growing up. Like I like math. I like math. Like what can I do with math? My brother was a very technical, uh, just hacker type, like super good with computers from the get go. And so when I was in high school, he started turning me on to programming a little bit, nothing crazy, but like started uh poking that interest a little bit because I could see what he was doing and it was like pretty exciting. Um, so kind of from there, you know, interest in math. And I also just say like, I didn't, growing up, I didn't, uh, I had a lot of good teachers, a lot of, um, you know, good people that helped me grow along the way. But I think like one thing I would mention is like, I found it so much of the learning process is, is self-driven do you want to learn this? Can you discipline yourself to like put in the time to learn this? Can you use your resources, the internet to help you uh, learn things? Um, just a little aside, like uh, in high school, I, I took a math class that I, we didn't actually have offered. It was an AP calculus class that um, wasn't offered at my school, but I was allowed to take it and kind of had one of the math teachers uh, proctor it. And I ended up learning most of the calculus for that class through a YouTuber, uh, Patrick JMT. And so like, I always use YouTube as a resource to help me grow. Um, that interest in math, that interest, that kind of spark in programming ultimately led me. I studied uh, computer science at MIT and just kind of grew with the subject there. Um, found it programming as a more application driven um, way of thinking. It was very similar to math, but it was more, uh, 
it had that application. It had something I could see right there, but same logical thinking. So I grew to love computer science and that kind of led me to um, where I am now, kind of being in a role that's very technical as well as I think learning from YouTube growing up kind of inspired me to also create my own content and help uh, others out um, through the platform. That's awesome. And um, you know, one, one thing I find very interesting is for a lot of people who have gotten started on YouTube is that it's also in that, you know, in that same vein of learning. So when I started making YouTube videos, one of the, one of the best pieces of advice or one of the, those things you hear around is that you don't know something until you've taught it. Like that mm-hmm. really reinforces your knowledge. But on the other side of that, also making videos helps me to improve my communication skills. It helps me to improve my diction, helps me to hopefully stop using as many filler words because I'm seeing myself mm-hmm. on camera all this time. And I think that anyone who's, who's excited about learning finds ways to learn through almost anything that they do or excited about a subject, they're excited about a concept, excited about success. They, they find those opportunities in each step of the process. Um, because you, you have to imagine that if you can explain a, a technical concept clearly, that's gonna carry you pretty far no matter where you're working. That's one of the most desirable skills out there period mm-hmm. these days. Yeah, no. I, I agree a hundred percent. And like thinking about that in my own day to day, I'm on a ton of customer calls kind of explaining how our chatbots work in my startup role. And because I have that technical knowledge and I can uh, communicate that pretty clearly, it definitely goes a long way. And, you know, whether you're working directly in a technical role or whether you're on the business side of things and just have to explain technical concepts, yeah, having that grasp of technical features and technical things, as well as kind of the, as you were mentioning, like get building up those communication skills to help you explain those. Um, definitely, definitely. I, I agree a hundred percent. They go super far. So where did the, the, uh, the data science um, aspect kind of start kicking in? You know, obviously we've talked about your computer science learning, your, your interest in math. Obviously, there's probably some parallels there, but, uh, you know, data science has been something that is more popular more recently. Was that when you started working at this company and you had to understand a little bit of NLP or was it kind of a natural inclination as you were learning in college and stuff as well? I think it was a bit of both. Uh, definitely just given the background that I, I walked through and just uh, you know, interested in math, and then that translates to programming. I think the immediate subject that I was always like, you know, this is what I'm going to do is data science because it's that hybrid. It's like I'm using the math skills, using the programming skills. So it definitely started, I would say, really when I picked up computer science in college more fully, like I kind of thought that data science would probably be the path. Uh, at MIT, all of the class, most of the classes are taught using Python. So, and Pretty there's a lot of very... <laughs> Uh, very uh, easy, what am I saying? And, um, a lot of class, like, so a lot of like algorithms classes, uh, statistics, um, probability, you know, like there's that Python data science overlap. So I like really, I think gear, like really enjoyed those types of classes, which kind of reinforced my desire to be in the data science realm. When I actually started really like, practicing and, and working in the industry, you know, it was, I guess, post-college a bit. Uh, I mean, anything data science related, I was very excited about. Um, ventured into the sports analytics field for a little bit. Um, but ultimately when I came to the startup, um, one of the things we were actively really needed to do was try to build out natural language processing models. Um, and I got super lucky where I was able to kind of finesse a master's program where I was doing research for our company. And through that process, that was like one, you know, over a year of just, you know, intense research on a single topic within the data science realm, uh, natural language processing. I think that really grew my love for, you know, being in data science, uh, whether it be through, you know, 
research of my own and being a full-time data scientist or just kind of trying to teach those same concepts through YouTube and just having a platform where uh, I can take what I've learned and take things I've, I've learned throughout the, the process and, and hopefully inspire others to learn those and, and enjoy those things as well. Awesome. I love that. I, I, I'm going to ask you more about that master's program that you finessed in a little bit. That, that <laughs> seems like a very interesting, uh, yeah. an inter interesting story. Uh, but I, I liked that, you know, in your, in your undergrad, there was a lot of reinforcement around like kind of similar areas, right? Like you're studying Python, you've taken a lot of these statistics courses, you have a math background. It seems like data science just from where you've come from and what you're learning at that period in time seemed like a pretty logical fit. And I think a lot of people don't realize that we get passionate about things when they're in line with what we're good at, but also well, what we're interested in, but more importantly, what we're good at. Like if you're getting a ton of reinforcement around, you know, basically the relevant math, Python programming, and at least some sort of like hands-on development, data science is probably going to be pretty easy for you to pick up. And you're going to be excited about picking it up because you're good at it, right? Yeah. Uh, I, uh, in, in college, I went through like seven different majors, I think. <laughs> and I had to take, I didn't realize that I wasn't, I was not the, the, the brightest back then, but I didn't realize it, but each of the majors I switched to, I think four of them, they required an intro stats class and they had four different stats class. So it was like stats for business, stats for health exercise science, stats for psychology, stats for um, environmental science or something like that. So I ended up taking four different stats classes that were all virtually the same, <laughs> but they were just like categorized yeah. slightly different. Yeah. And, you know, as, as it happened, I wasn't too bad at stats to begin with in terms of math. Uh, like, yeah, I, I'm not, I wasn't a great math student, but statistics made sense to me. I did well. But after the fourth math class, stats class, I was like, oh, I'm great at this. Like, this is, this is incredible. Why wouldn't I want to do more of this? Um, and honestly, if I didn't take at least two or three of those, I probably wouldn't be as, um, have, have as good aptitude at data science or, or the relevant skill set. And thus the, the interest in it probably wouldn't have emerged quite as strongly later in life. So I think it's important for anyone watching to think about, hey, like, where, where are all of the decisions that I've made kind of pointing me, but also what, what am I good at and why am I good at it? And, you know, there's no point in not kind of pulling on that rope and seeing where it ends up. Yeah. No, I think you, you, you bring up a good point there too, just with, I feel like my path, it seems like it was just clear from day one that, you know, data science is for me. And I definitely like, I guess, want to communicate, like I had so much uncertainty throughout the process. Like I, you know, I was all over the place, you know, do I want to do something technical? Do I want to like, you know, go into maybe like be a doctor or something or uh, do something more just like teaching full time. Like I had no idea really, like it sounded like when I explained it, like I knew exactly what I wanted to do, but it's an involving process. And as you mentioned, like you're switching around your majors, uh, you're, you have not a clear idea and, you know, it takes time for things to start clicking. And I think like another thing that's just good to communicate and like we always should be reminded of is like, even when you think that like someone just knew exactly what they're going to do, like, I don't think that's the full story. Like even today, I'm always uh, trying to figure out what, you know, what I want to do a year from now, two years from now, et cetera. Like it's a growing thing. Like definitely as Ken mentioned, like, once you start finding something that you're really excited about and you start feeling good about, uh, you know, explore that. And, you know, maybe it's not what you're doing 10 years from now, but I think just when you build on those interests, uh, you can go all sorts of places from that. Like you should be happy doing what you're doing and it is an evolving process. No one, even if they seem like they uh, are just like the master of everything, like they uh, seem like they know that their life plan is just set in stone. Like they probably also are still figuring things out. And I just, I don't know. I just like think that that's important to think about. No, I agree. I, I think the people that I've met that had the clearest understanding or the most confidence in their future were the people that experimented the most. Mm -hmm. And the experimentation, 
you know, I guess you can experiment with things that you're, that maybe you're not as good at or that are completely new, but usually we experiment with things that are kind of ancillary to what we're, we're doing already and they're low risk experiments, but you learn so much from trying all these different things that you get maybe not a clear path. I don't know what I'm going to be doing in two years, five years, whatever it is either. Um, but I have a pretty good, at least direction, you know, I have a compass to where that's going to take me because I think we both know from studying statistics, data science, whatever it is, that randomness affects so much of our life that sometimes it's not worth trying to design really specific outcomes because there could be so many different variables that would hijack them. And you just want to really set yourself up for success to, to be able to achieve, you know, the things that you want to. It's not about if you do achieve them. It's like, what can I do now to give me the highest probability of achieving them? And I think that, you know, that generally gets overlooked. We get so wrapped up either in too close to the present or too far in the future that, you know, reality breaks down a little bit. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. That was a, a nice way to, to put it. Awesome. Well, let's, uh, I want to hear about this master's program. Just how did you finesse this? What is that? What does that even necessarily mean? I wish I yeah. could have uh, <laughs> just been like, oh, like, call me, call, well, I'm trying to do that for a doctorate degree. I, I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, I definitely would say luck is involved a bit. Uh, I guess the base of it was uh, MIT offers a what's called 6A. MIT uses numbers for everything. Course 6 is computer science. 6A was like this special master's program that was like um, a master's of engineering and in industry. So there's I knew coming in, I knew that I wanted to get my master's. Um, I wanted to stay working at this company. I was really like, thought we were on the right track. I was really like excited about what we were doing. So I had these two conflicting things. Like, do I stay at the company? Do I do my master's? And so I guess I just kind of took a gamble a bit. I, I kind of worked with our, the co-founders of our company and, and said that I was, you know, I wanted to do my master's, but I wanted to stay at the company. And they were very flexible with, you know, what we did, they were familiar with uh, the 6A program. So we kind of discussed like maybe we could get um, our company Posh to be a 6A company. And I think traditionally the companies that you see in this program are like Google, Microsoft, uh, right here in the Massachusetts area, you have like Lincoln Labs, just a lot of big companies established. Uh, so on our end, being a, a startup at the time, you know, less than like really like six people at the time, you know, could we figure this out? And it just took a lot of emailing. So I, I reached out to the director of the 6A program, said, hey, this is what I'm trying to do. Um, gave him the details. I, I sat and had conversations with him. He gave me some other people to talk to and just made sure I kind of like kept those uh, communication doors open. It wasn't an easy process. Like there's a lot of uh, things that are a little bit confusing in the process. Uh, like I had to find a faculty advisor, uh, which is a weird balance because I was doing research for the company, but the faculty advisor was obviously working for MIT and had his own research lab that he, research group that he was managing. So it was like my research was kind of, you know, it, it was not part of what he was doing, but uh, I had to, you know, have someone that would still, um, you know, look over my work a, a little bit and, and, and be able to provide me guidance. So very lucky that I was able to find someone. I had luckily good connections that um, put me in touch with him. Uh, but yeah, it was a, a little bit of a difficult process, but I, I just made sure to kind of email the right people, um, kind of open up the door, see if something was possible before just kind of like thinking I had to choose one or the other. And it ended up working out. I ended up doing a research project that was, looking specifically at um, finding kind of a, the best way to take in incoming utterances to a chatbot and smartly route those to uh, specific intents. So the, t the domain is intent recognition, uh, we, we call it uh, at our company, and it's kind of known as uh, across the industry. Uh, and it was a good experience, very happy that it worked out. It was a really exciting time when I did the master's uh, because it was like the year that like OpenAI had just released GPT, 
uh, Google had just published BERT. So there's like these massive uh, game changer language models that were coming out and I was able to play around with them as part of the research uh, process. So, cool. so yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I really like that story. I think one thing that I really stress with the, the job market is that you don't know until you ask something. Like, I think a lot of people would have said, oh, I, I'm going to have to either choose one of these two things. And it's always worth the, the one, the experience, but it's also worth checking if the only drawback is really just time on your end, especially when you're in that position. I would imagine you have a reasonable amount of time um, yeah. be before having to make that decision. So I, um, I, I've talked with, I think, three people now who have gone into a scenario and they asked something that was a little bit unconventional and they were granted it. You know, my friend Tina Huang, she went in, she got a, I think it was a software engineering internship. And after she got the internship, she said, oh, I'm a little bit more interested in the data science. Can I work with that team instead? And, you know, they granted her that. And it's like, well, if, if you don't have exactly what you want from either a work or a school uh, situation, why not try and experiment and, and get the best of both worlds? I, I think that that is such, such a valuable lesson. And obviously it seems easy talking about it now. I'm sure it was a huge pain in the ass back then, but uh, I, I, I love that story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess the, the general rule of thumb is like, I guess you don't know, you can't just assume that someone's going to say no, like it doesn't hurt to ask, like worst thing is they do say no, but then at least, you know, yeah. <laughs> I said and no, like seven times in that sentence, but uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> disregard that. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, that's something very important. There was two different. Well. There was two different no's at least. <laughs> exactly. No and no, but we'll try to slipped. diversify our language a bit moving forward. Yeah. We could have slipped in like a nah or a, but regardless. <laughs> so I'll, I have a. I'll just pull up a thesaurus for the rest of this interview. I love it. I love it. Throw out uh, some huge terms. Well, I have a couple of pro. I say like a lot and actually a lot, so I'm trying to diversify off of those. We'll see how it goes. And I'm also <laughs> you're, trying you're to also... remove uh, filler word, uh, ums yeah. as well. So there's a lot going on in, in, in this thing <laughs> as, I, as I talk these days. It, it's funny you said that because when you were st talking about learning how to not say ums, likes, et cetera, I mean, I definitely have the same exact problem. The nice thing about the tutorials I make, I feel like I can, if I want to, cut them out with the editing <laughs> process. A little bit harder sometimes with the interviews, but uh, as yeah. I... So We're, true. There. We're going to try to improve all around a little bit of editing, a little, little bit of a <laughs> improvement of communication, I guess. Beauty of technology. It can help us in both places, right? Yeah. <laughs> so let's touch just a little bit on your current work in just what it's like to work at a startup. And then we'll move on. I want to learn and, and hear a lot more about your, your content creation over time. So I'm generally interested and I think, well, I have some experience, but what what are the differences you feel working at a startup versus perhaps a larger corporation versus like what school is actually like for most people? I said actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. And I feel like it's, it's a common question and a lot of people have a uh, different answers to it. Uh, having, you know, worked now at the startup for close to three years and various roles, the biggest thing at a startup is that you're wearing all sorts of hats. And I also think that your responsibilities are, are more highly elevated than they are at a, a big company. It takes longer at a big company to get that same set of responsibilities. Uh, so there, there's pros and cons to that. Um, at a startup, I felt uh, I have to figure out my own path. There's people that you know I report to that ultimately can make decisions at the end of the day, but they're very busy. Um, so it's, it's up to me sometimes making those hard decisions. You know, how do I handle this customer complaint? How do I, uh, you know, prioritize what tasks we're gonna prioritize, prioritize as a development team next? All sorts of things that I think that oftentimes at a bigger company, you, kind of see a structure where it's very clear cut um, what task people are doing and kind of who is responsible for what. I think at a startup, one of the things that I've noticed is that the boundaries are definitely not clear cut. 
everyone's kind of reaching into different areas and it's great. And it's also really challenging. It's great because it's like really motivating and exciting to be like, to to have such a big uh, amount of control over like product direction uh, about, you know, how successful something goes, uh, how, uh, you know, what types of new features you can work on. Uh, It's really exciting in that realm. But at the same time, it like I sometimes feel like I'm running around, I'm spread thin in a lot of areas, and as a result, I'm not really accomplishing anything major. Like I feel like I'm not accomplishing major things in any of the areas because I'm like spread thin. And I think sometimes at a bigger organization, and honestly, my experience at big companies is limited, so I don't want to like act like I am the knower of all things big company, but. I think you get a little bit more of an opportunity to really dive into one area and, and grow within that realm, see how a structure that like can kind of optimize different people's roles uh, and kind of you have that happening. Uh, so I rambled a, a little bit there, but I guess the gist of it is startup, a lot of responsibilities, exciting, but also challenging. Uh, big company, I feel like more of a sometimes niche area but you really get to grow in that area and you kind of have a little bit more defined what you should do now. Like it's a little bit more clear cut. I think you nailed it. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I can't say I've truly worked at a big company. I interned at a fortune 100 company for you know three months. I don't know if that gives me authority to say what, what it's like, but from my experience as well, I found that your expectations in a large company are generally clearer but the amount of impact that you feel you can have on the organization is a lot lower. And it's almost always a trade-off between those things. So in, in a startup, you, you generally have higher expectations, high expectations, but they're not as clear and they're subject to change. But the amount that you can impact either the company's bottom line or, or a product or any of those things is so much higher. And I, I personally enjoy being able to have a t- like a touch on something. I like being able to see the fruits of my labor I do not get motivated from anything outside of that. That's probably why I've chosen the career path that I have. <laughs> but um, you know, there's nothing wrong with either of the approaches. It just is a match with what you personally enjoy. If you really like security and know- knowing what you're expected to do, big company, definitely for you. And there's really good data science to be done. Or if you're really focused on a very, very specific area, same thing. If you want to, in theory, grow with a company more, if you want to have leave a really true imprint on an organization, a smaller one or a startup is probably a little bit of a better bet. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Awesome. So let's move on to a bit more about your YouTube content. Obviously, we've we've talked quite a bit about the tutorial style videos, some of the things that you're focusing on. I'm interested in what you, or how you would define your own personal teaching style. Oh, wow. I like that question. Uh, I I feel like my goal, you know, this comes across, sometimes this comes across, uh, maybe it doesn't come across as much as I want it always, but I like to have fun with things. Um, It should be like engaging. It should be like high energy. Like we should be able to joke around about what we're doing. So I feel like I like to play that card a bit, but then again, like when you're trying to get across a concept, you're trying to get across a library. Sometimes, you know, you just have to go through the details. So I would say my teaching style is like, I want to be upbeat. I want to be engaging. I want to be fun, but I also want to make sure that it's organized straight to the point, uh, straight to the point, clear and concise. You're going to get the information you need uh, and not spend too much time kind of like, rambling around details that might not be necessary uh, for the job at hand. Um, I guess building on that, trying to think of some other details. I like to make things very visual. I think that's one of the best ways to learn. So I think visual can contain a lot of different things. Uh, One way it's visual is like, I mean, actually having diagrams and stuff pop up on the screen. That's obviously very visual. But I think another thing that a lot of viewers and subscribers have enjoyed in tutorials that I make 
is being visual and just trying to show how I actually think and the process that I go through when I try to figure out a problem. So and that entails like, you know, I don't know everything. Like no programmer knows everything. Like we're all just doing Google searches. And so one of the strategies that I use is like, I want to make sure it's clear to people. Like, uh, you know, I don't memorize all these different commands in my head. Uh, I'm just thinking about logically, how do I want to approach this problem? And then I like to demonstrate in the tutorials. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm going to open up a, a, a web browser. Let's like do a Google search uh, and look up what we're trying to do and then find a post on Stack Overflow that will help us get it done. Like try to be visual in that regard as well. I think that is one of the most important things. I, I think so many people get frustrated because they don't have all of the, all of pandas memorized and come on, that's not a reasonable request. That's not something pretty much any data scientist does. I mean, maybe, you know, most of the commands are, that you frequently use, for example, I use pivot tables a lot, probably more than I should. Um, and I know how those function very, very well, but those things come with use and they're also not overwhelmingly useful for the first basically year of me being a data scientist. I had one Jupyter notebook that one of my professors had put together and I would just reference it every time I needed to do anything. I would go in, I would search it. Okay. That's what I need. Copy and paste. Probably didn't develop as much as I could have in that, in that period of time, but I was doing legitimate data science work effectively all from this one notebook of, of referencing. It was mostly pandas and NumPy and then I had separate one uh, for scikit-learn. And that's real data science. I mean, people forget that all of these things are for solving the problems that you're focused on. It's not necessarily a matter of what tools you use. The, the tools are a function of the problem. You know, if, if you can do something in Excel and it makes sense to do it in Excel, why, why not really? Unless longer term, it's not gonna make sense to do it in Excel. So I like that you really also help to open up that or or remove the curtain from what this work is really like because you know I, I spend so much time debugging I spend so much time fixing well not not in Python but problems with semicolons when I write in in Java or whatever it is right yeah. and, uh, and and that's part of the game and and I think that that's that's not as commonly brought up as as I think it should be because I know I would have gotten a lot less well, I didn't watch as many YouTube videos when I was starting out, but if I was watching all of these things and no one ever made mistakes, I'd be like, I could never do this. How, did, how, are, how are they keeping all of that in their brain? So yeah. a very, very important aspect in my opinion. Yeah, no, I agree. And I like the, the small little point you, you hit on while you're speaking on that, just that if it makes sense to solve my problem, like I can use Excel, like it doesn't matter. Like just think about your problem. That's the big picture. Like I, I, I don't like when people hate on a certain technology, uh, like they have issues with it. Like ultimately it comes down to each person has their own personal preferences. Sometimes it makes sense to, um, you write a script with Python pandas. Sometimes it makes sense to open up an Excel spreadsheet and do the same type of analysis there. Like there's no one way or the other, like just a matter of taking your problem, figuring out what, what a way to solve it is that makes sense for you. I agree, but it just never makes sense to use R. What a terrible line. No, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I just, I use R for a couple of things for PCA and factor analysis. I like the libraries better, but that's pretty much it. And I haven't yeah. done any of that in maybe two years, so it could have changed, but. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. <laughs> so, you know, regarding your YouTube channel, you know, what would you like to accomplish in the next couple of years? What's, you know, who would you like to reach better? You know, is there something, maybe an overarching goal that you have uh, that you'd be willing to or like to share with with uh, people while you have, uh, you know, another platform to do so? Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, a lot of things I'm really excited about doing uh, with the channel and moving forward. Uh, I think the biggest thing is like, I feel like, you know, I'm, I can be fairly fun, like upbeat, like, people might enjoy seeing a little bit more of like vlog style projects, I, I would put it. I, I think one of my biggest goals, and we'll see if this happens in the near future or, or down the road, but 
I really am inspired by creators like Mark Rober who create cool the stuff. coolest stuff, <laughs> like just engineer, like just, they have so much fun, like thinking of a creative project and engineering it and then kind of making that a really fun, like entertaining uh, video to watch you where you get educational value out of like, you know, learning about the, the tech and the, the engineering that thought that went into it. But he also just like, wow, this is so cool. This is so fun. Like it inspires you, motivates you. Uh, so I would love to take computer science, take data science and figure out ways I could adapt that and, and make more types of videos that are project focused. I think that that's like one of my goals in the future. I don't know if it'll happen you know, tomorrow, but I would love to branch into that territory at some point. For the immediate future, I think the biggest thing is uh, make more project videos, make more data science project videos, uh, make more content on libraries that I haven't explored yet. Uh, another personal goal is just being a little bit more consistent with how often I'm, I'm able to get content out. It's really a challenge balancing both startup responsibilities with YouTube responsibilities, but figuring out if there's anything I can do there to like be a little bit more consistent in that realm. Uh, but I don't know. I'm, I'm excited. Uh, I, I'm liking the balance of things right now. Excited for the content that will come out in the future. Uh, and we'll just see how it goes. Heck yeah. Well, hopefully I can help out. We may be able to collab on one of those, those projects. I think that'd be a lot of fun. That's the direction I'm hoping to go as well. And um, you know, we just did a, a, a couple of us did a little skit video uh, on, on stuff data scientists say. So if you ever <laughs> want to start your, uh, your acting career, we might do a couple of more of those in the future. So. Oh man, I'm ready. I'm ready. If you need an actor, just call me up. I'm ready anytime. Deal. I, will I might let not you be know. the best actor. I might not be the best actor, but I have a uh, heart. I hey, say. That's, that's half the battle, <laughs> at least. <laughs> so well, the last, so go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say at some point when Corona settles, if you're still in Hawaii, uh, it might have to, the skit might have to be over there. I, I wouldn't mind a, a plane ride uh, over there. That Heck yeah. Well, you know, there is a pretty large data, data science or machine learning YouTube community these days. I think it would be fun to do maybe a, a, a weekend or a week somewhere where we all just get together, meet each other, produce some content. Uh, could be in Hawaii, could be, you know, could be somewhere in South America, you never know, but obviously post Corona, but I, I am uh, very on board for, for those types of trips. So sign me up as well. Awesome. Well, the, the last thing I have for you is, is I like to open the floor at the end to, to talk about any projects, anything that, um, that you'd like to talk about, anything you want to alert people of, and also how people can best get into contact with you or, or learn about your stuff, whatever that might be. Awesome. So let me think, uh, I want to, I want to have something good to, to finish on. Uh, I guess I, I want to give like one point of wisdom, um, just small snippet, just like, you know, I think we really define like our own paths and like, it's both scary and also really in, like awesome at the same time that like, everyone that's like interested in data science, everyone that's trying to branch into any new career, like we control so much of, of what we end up doing. And if you're dedicated and you're interested in an area and you put in the time to learn more and more about that, that topic, and especially with data science, if you're willing to, you know, start playing around with some projects that are inter you're interested in, you will have success in this field. So I guess that's my like one um, little note to like, keep in mind and, and also keep in mind that it, it's changing. We're still, we're always figuring out, uh, what we want to do next, but I guess as far as the, the shout outs and whatnot to, uh, my own channel, how to contact me. Um, if you search in Google, I think also I'll make, uh, Ken, uh, throw it in the, the link of course, uh, or the dis shoot. I said the wrong word in, well, in sure the description Ken and in the pinned comment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. I'll, I'll, I'll throw a, a link to my channel. I also am trying to branch out a bit on uh, Instagram and Twitter, post some fun content in both of those places. So uh, Instagram at Keith Galley and Twitter at Keith Galley as well. Um, those will both, to, they'll be under your, uh, I, on the videos, I'll usually just put it right under your head the whole time. So they will now know that that goes to Twitter and Instagram. So you're- Okay, you're nice, good. I love it. So you can just do one of these, like <laughs> click, click this. 
Yeah, somewhere on. I don't know where you're gonna put it, and I don't know where my head is right now. But you know, somewhere. <laughs> That's perfect. Here. Yeah. <laughs> Great stuff. Awesome. Well, thank you again for coming in. I really enjoyed this. I think everyone will, will, will quite enjoy this as well. Definitely check out Keith's channel and uh, remember to contact him. Just blow up his DMs on Twitter. So <laughs> I love it. I love it. Now blow blow them up on Instagram. I'm <laughs> Instagram. Sorry. Them on. Yeah, Instagram is better. Twitter, you can DM me, but I'm not as good at responding. But love I, it. I, I don't uh, think I've you. ever responded to a Twitter DM. So it's it's tough to balance, but uh, I try my best. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Ken, for having me. This was a lot of fun, and uh, it just was nice to have an opportunity to have a little bit of a, a different side of things as opposed to the the tutorials that I normally do. So thank you, um, thank you, everyone that uh, sat through this uh, conversation. Hope you enjoyed it. Hopefully you learned something. Feel free to message me on D, uh, Instagram or um, you know follow the, my channel or whatnot. And hopefully Ken and I can do some fun things, skits and whatnot, and what uh, all sorts of projects in the future. So I'm excited for that. Heck yeah, looking forward to it.